Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this roundtable discussion um, on farming and forestry, um, working together and looking into new markets in the future. Um, firstly, quick thank you to Land Management 2.0 um, and the Institute of Chartered Foresters for putting this um, webinar together this morning. Um, and also to our panel of experts for their time um, and answering what I hope will be some really interesting questions. Um, our panel consists of uh, Garant Richards, Head Forester at the Duchy of Cornwall, uh, Luke Hemmings, the wo a Woodland Officer from the Forestry Commission, Stephen McKenzie um, from Ouchmore Farm and Tyrion Keatinge, uh, Temperate Agroforestry Project um, Developer from Cretaterra. Um, my name is Nina Williams, I'm the Head Forester at a state called Cowdery. Uh, in Sussex near Midhurst. Um, we run a typical mixed estate of farming and forestry, uh, just under 3,000 hectares of woodland and uh, 1,500 hectares of in-hand um, farm management as well as many tenanted farms across the estate. Um, traditionally, I think across our estate, um, farming and forestry have been run as very much two separate enterprises. Um, and there's been little collaboration uh, beyond um, some minor shelter belts uh, between the two of us. Um, but looking forward um, across the estate, we're at quite an interesting point in time now, where our, some of our agroforestry scheme, uh, some of our um, countryside stewardship and steward, um, environmental stewardship schemes are coming to an end. And we've got a real opportunity to look at how we can work better um, between the core land management businesses on the estate and primarily being farming and forestry working closer together. Um, this is going to be quite a challenge, I think, for us. Uh, we're going to have to look at a fresh look at, from the ground up about what we actually do, why we're doing it, and identify some of those key problems and maybe some opportunities for how we can work better together in the future. Um, and I don't think we're alone in this, so it's a great opportunity today to see this panel and hear their opinions, um, and I hope that it'll be use and of interest for everyone. Um, Looking in the recent past, I think collaboration between um, farming and forestry has been at a relatively small scale in this country. Um, shelter belts, um, conversion of problem areas on a farm into forestry have been some fairly common solutions, but it's arguable about whether they've been truly effective, um, both for the farmer or indeed productive for the forester. Um, I think a lot of the past um, has been grant led and until quite recently in under countryside stewardship, uh, we haven't been on a level, level playing field there either, um, with forestry receiving approximately a third of the grant funding that farming might do. Um, so there was really little incentive for greater collaboration. Um, but this is a really interesting time at the moment. And I think um, it be there's a real opportunity for us to work better together. And looking forward, I think across the land management sector, uh, we're facing very similar threats from climate change, extreme res, um, weather events, a greater range of pests and diseases, both in the trees, but also affecting arable crops as well, and a reduced palette of pesticides and herbicides that can be used to um, affect these diseases. So there really is a push now for us to work closer together. And I'll be interested to see um, how, um, what, what our panelists come up with today. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our panel um, and um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves and give a few um, thoughts on um, where they see the future of farming and forestry is going. Um, I'll get the discussion started, but anyone who's listening to this presentation, if you can ask you to use the question and answers um, function, not the chat fun function at the bottom of the screen to pose your questions, I'll be monitoring these questions and I'll pick out um, some good questions to present to the panel. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass you over um, and we'll start with uh, uh, Grant Richards from the Duchy of Cornwall um, and ask him to introduce himself and how he sees forestry and farming working better in the, in the near future. Grant, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks Nina. Um, yeah, no, and, and, and welcome everyone. Um, so I, I'm the head forester for the Duchy of Cornwall, the Duchy um, manages, owns and manages about 130,000 acres of land um, across mainly the west and southwest of the country, of which there's about 6,000 acres of woodland, plus other, other trees and, uh, and uh, etc., which is, which is my patch. And um, I've been with the Duchy for nearly 25 years now, roving over the whole of that land. And um, 
And I kind of agree with Nina, actually. I mean, we've got to bear in mind that a lot of the land is in tenancies, long-term tenancies. So to a degree, there is a limit to what the landowner can, can do and influence. Um, and there has always been, I always say there's a, there's a fence, there's a fence between the forest and the farmer. And usually the, the only time the forest and the farmer ever meet is to decide who's paying for the fence. Um, and what we need to do is, is kind of take that fence down really and, uh, and actually start looking at integrated land use, landscape scale, catchment scale, and, uh, and, and think about, you know, there's a limited amount of land in this country with a high population and many demands on it, what we want our land to deliver. And we need to get a lot, lot smarter at, at linking up and sharing ideas. And in that sense, I, I guess you could say that, you know, the, um, the world is catching up with where His Royal Highness has been for Prince of Wales for many years. He has uh, advocated this integrated land use. And if you look at some of the estates, such as his home at Highgrove, there he has been promoting uh, trees on the, on the wider farm street for, for 40 plus years. And there are, I've been there this week, there are trees in hedgerows, trees in fields. Um, there are new copses created. There are shelter belts. There are orchards and, and, and agroforestry experiments. So we do have some sites on the duchies I've been involved in, which I think are, 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 are delivering what we're going to be talking about today. But um, so much more is, is needed and we're a long way from where we need to be. Uh, thank you, Grant. That's um, really interesting. And, and I think it'll hit home to, to a lot of people out there. Um, Sticking with Woodland, can we have um, some initial thoughts from uh, Luke Hemmings, please, Woodland Officer at the Forestry Commission? Hi, Nina. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm Woodland Officer currently up in the northeast of England, so close to the border with Scotland. Um, but I've worked around the country in Thetford and um, Forest of Dean and Dartmoor, Devon. Um, and in, in all of those places you know there's always there's always been an interaction between uh you know us as foresters and other landowners and other land users um but as you say at the moment we just we don't have that kind of integrated um model that, that we need um going forward uh you know everything's moving in this direction from you know hopefully the the grants and, and things that are on offer to um people's recognition that what we're doing with the land has a much more of a knock-on effect than just um, the, the, the sort of on the footprint of the land itself. It's it's much more, you know, everything's in, interconnected, and um, what what one person does affects their neighbour and the rest of society. So we need to be looking at you know the various different benefits that we can bring onto farms and into forestry as well, and and sharing good practice and sharing uh, the best information we have available. Thank you. Um, I, I think we'll be looking to, towards the Forestry Commission more and more in the future as well uh, to utilise that expertise in this what is relatively quite a new new area for for our country. Um, Stephen Mackenzie, let's have a let's have some opinions from a farmer. See what he thinks. Well, I feel totally outscaled here. Um, I'm just a, a I'm a farmer from north of Inverness, uh, 20 miles north of Inverness in the north of Scotland, and um, very much a small family upland hill farm. Um, you know, beef and sheep. Um, and we decided about 20 years ago that we would like to do some legacy woodland and, and um, alter the structure of the farm a little bit by, by so doing. Um, I think, you know, we, we want to be thinking about why is there so much farmer resistance? And, you know, north of Scotland here, we're very much sheep country. Um, and and there just seems to be a huge conflict between the sheep farmers and in particular and forestry in general and it's very interesting to hear again and there say the you know the the fence is the boundary and and certainly up in the highlands of scotland it certainly is the boundary um why is that resistance well there's probably several reasons um the the aging population of farmers um particularly in the livestock industry um means that they're perhaps old-fashioned old school two blades of grass is better than one, not looking for diversification opportunities or looking to do other things on the farm. Um, perhaps the tenancy structure with some of these states doesn't help. There's been we've got slightly different laws in Scotland and there's a general mistrust from the estates in tenanting land now that you're creating perhaps a rod for their own back 
in terms of tenants' rights to buy, etc. So it would be easier to plant trees than give an opportunity to the land to um, a young entrant or, or somebody. Um, land is clearly diminishing even in rural areas. You know, there is urban growth. Um, you know, Inverness is a city which has grown about three times in size over the last few years. So even in, in real rural areas, we're seeing, we're seeing um, a challenge there. But I think the key is better integration, this whole holistic approach. And, you know, the right species in the right place for the right purpose, I think is going to be key. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and uh, if I can ask Tyrion um, to jump in at this point, um, hopefully a man with lots of agroforestry experience um, as an agroforestry project developer, um, and hear his thoughts on this subject. Yeah, thanks, Nina. Um, well, it's really interesting to hear the, the views of my esteemed colleagues. I'm sure that I am also uh, a little bit outweighed in terms of experience, but I maybe hope to bring some perspective from the agroforestry perspective specifically. So what I do is I develop projects, agroforestry projects with Preta Terra. Um, we specialize in creating agroforestry systems with farmers that are um, scalable and viable um, on a basic level for the farmer. Um, I've been working in different parts of the world, but now I'm turning my focus back to the UK and we're developing a pilot project in Wiltshire in the UK on a small estate there. And what we're trying to do there is really approach some of these key challenges that are um, facing farmers and facing land managers when it comes to getting trees on farms. Like it's already been mentioned, there's not a lot of integration between forestry sectors and farming sectors. So what we're hoping to do in this pilot is I would say address five, five of the maybe well, more key problems that we see facing farmers in agroforestry uh, today in the UK. And those, those include, for example, um, basic commercial viability. So how does a farmer make an agroforestry system actually fit in with their farm as a commercial enterprise? Um, we also try to make sure that the, the, the designs are optimized to go alongside the farm and to make sure the management is easy for the farmer, even when there are trees incorporated into their fields in a way that they're not used to. Um, we're trying to approach some transition finance because we're still in the early stages. We need to have finance to, um, to make a change happen. You know, there, there needs to be finance both to actually develop new systems and new ways of doing things and then actually to get the trees onto the farms. And I think those two things need to be connected more strongly. Um, Often also farmers don't necessarily have the knowledge resources that they need or necessarily the will to do the management. So on, on this pilot, we're actually looking to find ways of co-management so that the farmers are not necessarily the people who have to do the tree management. And I think this is where the foresters really come in. Um, or let's say maybe somebody who uh, grows fruit, for example, this is where there's a collaboration opportunity. Um, if we can find structures between a farmer and let's say a forester to make sure that they don't necessarily have to take on the management themselves. I think that's maybe a big, um, a big challenge. Um, and then of course, we want to make sure that there's a really clear articulation of the public goods that come from these things. Um, as, as the subsidy system is changing now, we need to find a way to make sure that um, all of these various benefits that we talk about from agroforestry are actually really clearly articulated and made obvious so that farmers can actually get access to these, to these public goods funding in whatever form they end up, uh, in, end up being. Um, so that's maybe preempting the discussion a little bit, but I'm very curious to hear you guys, your guys' thoughts on it and see how we can see what we can work out together. So thank you. Uh, thank you also to uh, Land Management 2.0 for the invitation. It's really cool to be here. Brilliant. Thanks, Tyrion. Um, is, wow, I had trouble keeping up with the amount of questions I've written down from, from that. Um, it really sparks the imagination. So I think I'm going to kick off the questions, um, really feeding on from your last point, which is about public good. Uh, and it links very well to our first question from um, the public here, which is um, looking for at the new grant schemes that are becoming available under ELMS. Bear in mind, no one knows the exact details around this yet. Um, is the natural capital uh, financial bonds within this scheme going to be enough to incentivize farmers to 
uh, dip their toe into agroforestry in a bit more detail. And I'm going to pose this question first to the Forestry Commission to see if they've got anything they might want to share with us. And then I'm going to go to you, Stephen, uh, as a bit of an advance warning to see a farmer's thoughts on this. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, and thanks, Ian, I think, who asked that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's anybody's guess at the moment, really. We don't know what the support is going to look like, although we've had lots of um, consultations and we have a, we have a rough idea of, of what um, is being talked about. I think I think with all of this, um, um, there's there's a much bigger question around kind of culture and and the culture of of farmers and and foresters, and that is um, really the key thing that we need to get right here. That you can throw as much money as you want at something, but if people don't want to come along with the change that you're trying to bring, then they're not gonna they're not gonna come on that journey. Um, someone said recently that culture eats. Um, strategy for breakfast or something like that. I think somebody wrote that on, on Twitter. But um, I think one of the, the obstacles that I think Stephen slightly alluded to when he was talking about farmers' attitudes to trees is that there is this idea that somehow by um, creating woodland or taking land out of sort of food production, you're in some way failing as a farmer. You're, you're taking land out of food production um, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of losing value. Um, I think we need to try and change that mindset by showing, you know, farmers feel proud about producing um, high quality, um, sustainable food from the countryside. We want them to feel proud about producing high quality, sustainable timber as well, as well as all the environmental benefits and the benefits that it could bring to other aspects of the farm, like soil protection, like animal welfare, like water quality and all of those things so but I think we need to focus on this idea that there is you know it's not it doesn't have to be taking land out of production you can have a very um, attractive um, you know, valuable woodland um, asset resource that you're creating whether it's you know broadleaf woodland conifer woodland whatever it whatever it might be that can be an asset to the farm and, and a long-term investment and, and something to be kind of proud of it doesn't have to be a, a shameful thing. Uh, thanks, Luke. Um, so over to Stephen. Um, yeah, what what really inspired you to uh, look at planting trees on your land, and and uh, do you think that the grants will be there to help you? Uh, it's it's going to be quite difficult for me to answer on the ELMS scheme because we don't have a similar or we don't have that scheme in Scotland. Um, we did have an well agri environment climate schemes, which I believe are very similar. Um, so, so you know, they were were slightly different in the way we go about it. Um, in terms of in, you know the barrier, I mean, it, it it's integration. I think is the key thing here. We need to integrate land use with um, integrate land use by for, with forestry with land use with agriculture, and and trying not to have the fence. You know, we, we need to to be doing both things on the same areas of land, um, and perhaps looking at um, a sort of a, a holistic approach in terms of landscape view as well. You know, we maybe need to be going to the public and asking them what their views on what happens in the landscape. You know, we've traditionally farmed the landscape in the Highlands of Scotland with sheep and barley. Well, is that what the public want going forward? So, you know, if, if we are taking subsidy money and grant money, we maybe need to listen more to what the public want. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I think that's very true. Um, although I'm not sure. Um, I think we get a, a wide range of opinions when it comes to uh, what people want to see as well. Um, so just widening this discussion out a bit further, um, Grant, what do you see as some of the limiting factors that are uh, stopping us working closer together at the moment? Um, well, there are there there are several. I think there is. Um... There is tradition, uh, the traditional land use, which of course uh, land, land use has evolved and changed. I mean, once the country was almost covered in trees, but people tend to want what they what they have known in their lifetime and remember. And so um, tradition and cultural values, et cetera, and heritage values, um, all, all of these come into play and people resist change. I think there's also the, the whole issue of education skills and training. We just haven't integrated enough. So foresters generally don't understand the farming community and, and farmers don't understand the, the forestry community and sort of fear trees and see them as a burden and a hindrance. 
Um, and we talked about farmer resistance. We must also talk about forest resistance, something we're thinking about on the duchies, you know, all of this might mean actually the fence coming down and in some cases letting stock into our woods, allowing more grazing within the woodland. So there is forester resistance as well. It's not, it's not just the farming community. I think the grants and subsidies is an issue. Um, I would say generally that uh, tree planting has been woefully underfunded and I don't think any recent grants have come anywhere and near enough to truly understand uh, what it is to take land out of um, farming and uh, and pay the right money to not just plant a tree but to maintain that tree going forward and I think you know the you know even under some of the carbon that uh, funding it's it's woefully low for what we're really trying to achieve and if if this really is a climate crisis and a crisis we're facing then we should be putting a lot more towards it um, and then there's also you know there are are, are regulatory um, issues as well which um you know even when you get someone who wants to plant trees they suddenly find there seems to be everything thrown against them to to stop them doing that so i think there are there are many things that are um that are that, that are preventing us going there and, it, and it's a strange time isn't it when the world is waking up and before covid everyone this time last year i mean trees woodlands forests the need for them were in every headline it felt and so there is this climate crisis we call it a crisis and yet we're not responding it to it as as one would respond to a crisis the covid crisis has shown us how you respond to a crisis um we haven't really treated it as a climate crisis and there's a huge amount more to be done if we're going to take this seriously. Thank you um, and I think very true. Um, I seem to be getting a lot of questions here about um, the need for greater education on both sides of the fence, both forestry and farmers, um, and also some questions about where we should potentially access that information and whose role that is. Um, Tyrion, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Put this one to you initially and then over to Luke as well because um, it seems to be education and, and, a, and a need for knowledge is, uh, is driving um, a lot of the questions out there. Yeah well, it's, a, it's a big question. Uh, the, uh, the knowledge is not that easy to find. I can certainly recommend some, some places for example there was recently an agroforestry handbook that was published by the Soil Association so there are some resources starting to come out. Um, but I haven't seen that much really solid communication between different um, sort of forms of production. I'm not, not even just talking about farmers and forests, but between different farmers who could integrate their um, different types of land use with trees and, and non-tree crops. Um, I think that's one place where foresters can really have a hand is by understanding, for example, what are the silvicultural implications of planting in the open or in alleys? Um, on farms and how is the integration with crops actually going to in, impact the, the trees. Um, coming into this I was interested because there are some estate representatives here and in my mind that represents an opportunity where you already sort of have a forester and a farmer around the table um, and a space where you can share knowledge from the forester to the farmer. But it's still a key gap, to be honest, in, in my opinion, when it comes to temporary agroforestry is actually helping people to understand in a simple way how they can get trees onto their farms. That's one of the things we're trying to do with our pilot is we want to be able to publish more information for farmers, simple decision making tools or, um, for example, connecting them with people who would be able to help them make the decisions. And I think that's still a big gap, to be honest, that needs to be filled in the UK. Uh, thank you. And uh, over to, to Luke, um, what do you see as the Forest Commission's role in potentially uh, educating moving forward, also providing access to some of these resources that people are looking for? Um, well, I think I think we do have a role and we've certainly been feeding into things like the new professional uh, forestry standard, which has been, you know, try, um, been consulted on as a sort of new route into the forestry profession um, in collaboration with the ICF and others. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a big role for professional organisations to play actually um, and I think land management has 2.0 have been sort of trying to do this to some extent to try and bring um, professionals from different disciplines together um, and have the conversations like we're having today which is great and I think I, I would love to see more um, collaborative events between you know, uh, members of the NFU, members of the CLA, um, you know, Game and, um, Game and Countryside Conservation Trust, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, and, um, and others, the ICF coming together and having, you know, joint events, joint uh, conferences and things like that, where we can talk about issues that affect us all. Um, 
I do also think that you know we we do need to know enough. We need to we need to learn about other disciplines, and I think that could be brought in during during training. Um, you know during learning um you know studying at college things like that studying at university you know i know i went to newton rig there were there were plenty of opportunities for there to be more crossover between um the sort of la other land management sectors gamekeepers things like that but we tended to cross over more with the sort of um biodiversity conservation side of things which which is, tends to be less kind of applied to to farming and more about you know that side of things is also separate at the moment you know if you're a conservationist you're sort of tend to be separate from the land managers which doesn't really make sense either so i think this is a much bigger conversation about you know breaking down those barriers and um having that integrated model but we can't expect everyone we can't expect every forester to know as much as a farmer does and we can't expect every farmer to know as much as a forester knows they need to we need to all know enough um to be able to have that conversation and um I think someone in the chat mentioned about farmers feeling involved in the process. I think that's really important as well for farmers to know enough about what's happening on their land. They might have a professional helping them to do the work, but um, if they know, you know, know enough to see what's happening and, and to feel part of that process, then they're going to feel much more open to it. You know, maybe less like they're going to have the wool pulled over their eyes. They're not going to get the full value from their um, asset, whatever it might be. Um, and that, I think that also comes down to sort of continuing professional development. I think it's it's on all of our um, on all of our um, responsibilities to go and make sure we're learning about other disciplines and and learning about our um, sort of colleagues and and people working in other fields. Um, so I think I think that's that's really important as well. We need to take responsibility, and there are people already doing that. I think there are some good examples of people um, who are you know on on some of the estates and foresters who are. Um, you know, going beyond and looking outside their, uh, beyond their fence, so to speak. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Stephen, can I pass over to you and get uh, thoughts from a farmer as to how, what, what information did you have to access and how, how did you go about transforming some of your land? Uh, well, I, I, I come at, even come at farming from a non-farmer. I'm an engineer um, who came back to run the family farm. And um, so I have got no formal rural qualifications at all. Um, however, education and intellect aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, we just need an ability to learn, an ability to pick things up by doing research. Um, we, we relied very much on a forester. And it's you know something that said was, um, I think Geraint said earlier, you know, the forester is key to getting good schemes going on agricultural land as he is in commercial forestry. Um, so I think you know having a forester that works with you, that listens to your concerns and can hopefully allay some of those concerns is essential. Um, and that does come back to education. Um, we've started over the last few years working with the local school of forestry um, and taking them out onto farm, taking the, the third years out onto farm and showing them the diversification of the operations that we have here. And they also go to an arable unit as well to find out what was on, on, on a lowland arable unit. And I think that education and finding out the problems that other industries have and even being able to talk to a farmer with some knowledgeable terms is really useful in the same way as a farmer should be able to talk to a forester with a knowledge of some of the terms that the forester is going to use. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to move away slightly from the um, information resources available to us and some education requirements and uh, look to a question that seems to be at the heart of many um, of the questions I'm being asked here, which is, uh, does it stack up financially? Um, I've got a question here saying, um, if you take out the subsidies from the equation and look purely at productivity and income, does integrating trees into the landscape make farming more profitable. Um, Tyrion, I'm, I'm going to go to you with this one first. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's, uh, well, that's a difficult question. In some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. And over what time scales is really a big question. Um, this is part of uh, the challenge of designing agroforestry systems is, is making sure you pick the right species and pick the right management that's appropriate for your farm. Um, and um, well, that's what we're trying to deal with. I don't think there's one question saying, yes, it's profitable or no, it's not. Um, in many cases so far in the UK, it's not been profitable. 
but it does depend on the kind of things you're doing. If you're talking about long cycle timber where you're planting oak, for example, and you might not be getting a final crop for 140 years, then that's probably going to be a very unappealing economic horizon for a farmer. Um, and that's unlikely to change unless we find a mechanism for maybe creating cash flow more short term if they are purely thinking about profitability and productivity because you need to have the right timescales in mind. Some examples like Stephen Briggs, for example, who was mentioned, um, his, I think has been mentioned before, um, he's working in Cambridge in agroforestry, but he's using um, apples and that's not forestry. He's getting, a, getting an income from that in five years. Um, so there are very different forms of agroforestry and the priorities of the system will impact the design and will impact the profitability of it. It is possible to make it profitable, but, um, well, that's going to take some time. Economies of scale, sorry if I'm, I'm rambling on, economies of scale are also very important. And maybe that's one area where foresters could create interesting models where they're supporting farmers to have trees on their farm. But, for example, a forestry organization might be managing trees on multiple farms and making use of economies of scale over multiple farm areas in order to actually make it economically viable. And then, for example, just paying a rent to the farmer instead. Um, there are many different ways of doing it and we need to uh, address those challenges. Oh, thank you, Tyrion. Um, uh, just a couple of thoughts from myself here. I mean, is it, are these benefits and maybe not so much the bottom line as are, are we making the trees profitable? Um, as a separate income stream, but is, is is really planting trees on farmland in the right place, providing wider benefits that actually improve the farm productivity as a whole. Uh, I'm going to go to Stephen with this one and then um, ask Garant for his thoughts as well to see what benefits trees could provide the farm other than monetary um, direct returns from timber. I, I, I guess the there's, that sort of gives another question, and, and that is, what is agroforestry? You know, what actually is it? Um, are we simply planting crops in, in areas of trees or planting trees in areas of crops? That's not agroforestry as far as I would define it. I would think it's more, we're looking at the holistic approach. So, you know, trying to leverage more profit out of the crops by having the trees and vice versa. Um, you know, healthy crops mean healthy trees, um, shelter belts, river maintenance, you know, riparian maintenance, um, all of the other benefits which come, um, you know, st stability of, of um, hillsides, all of these other things are benefits which can come from, from a holistic approach. Um, in terms of the finance, I think a little bit more flexibility in the schemes, uh, certainly the old woodland grant scheme, was very defined in when you can let livestock into it. And, you know, we, we've got one part of our plantation has done exceptionally well. And at year 12, year 14 could easily have supported light grazing with livestock, but I'm not allowed to. I have to wait and wait and wait. Meanwhile, the grasses are going rank. The biodiversity within the woodland is not as good as it could be. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of being restricted um, perhaps unnecessarily um, by that. The other thing, and, and it's again comes back to sort of playing around with things, and we said the fence was the boundary. Well, do we need fences these days? There is some technology out there where you can put electronic collars on cattle and move them by, by um, a map and by, by a GIS map on your computer. It's a no, no fence system developed in Norway. They use it successfully for goats, and we actually have a trial scheme going on up here where we're, we're playing around with it in cattle. So I think we have to look at what, what is agroforestry and the integration and try and make that, make that pay for us. Um, forestry on its own doesn't pay. Agriculture on its own really doesn't pay without subsidy. We have to look at how we can make them both work together better with, with, or with, with the system we've got or with a new system. We have an opportunity with Brexit. I mean, I'm, I'm not a Brexiteer, but, but we have an opportunity with Brexit to maybe look at how support comes in to agriculture and to forestry and jointly to agriculture and forestry. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Garant, um, how, how do you see this issue and, you know, what benefits can trees provide to the farm, but also potentially what benefits can, 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 can working closely with farmers help 
us as foresters in maybe even the management of woodlands? Well, um, I mean, it's interesting, Stephen, Stephen picked up on a point I said, we haven't actually, there's a couple of definitions I think we need to think about. One is agroforestry. And um, I might slightly disagree. I mean, I see agroforestry as, as any interaction really of trees and the farm landscape. And I think that could be increasing hedgerow trees and field trees right through to, you know, far more formal systems that, such as you might see at Stephen Briggs. So I, I think there is, there is fear surrounding this term. I think some farmers think we're going to plaster the whole of their farm with trees and actually often it's not and some of you might have been to the the, the scheme of the Pont Bren in, in Wales where you know only small parts of the farmland were planted with trees often the steep bits that were pretty useless anyway for farming and yet they've they've measured huge gains for the farming activity as a result of that planting so I think we have to define what agroforestry is it's a spectrum it always will be um I think the other definition we need to come to is productivity and farmers and foresters tend to focus on productivity farmers want to produce food from every acre and a lot of foresters want to produce timber and and we just have to redefine that we're still talking about productivity but we're looking at the land producing far more goods we're looking at clean air clean water healthy soils biodiversity social as well as of course importantly food and timber but but we're still being productive we're not becoming unproductive we're actually producing more from the land we have and I think it's really important that we get that that mindset to, to, to deal with this sometimes embarrassment that I'm giving land up from production you're not at all actually you're actually going to make that productive more productive and and of course for the longer term as we particularly look at the health of some of the soil, farming soils and how little life they've got they've got in them so I think we've got to get those definitions right and I think we've also got to accept that change is coming there's change in agricultural policy and subsidies coming um, and there's nothing we can do about that. And that is going to make a lot of current farming practices, you know, unviable going forward. And so change is coming and we have to think of new solutions. I, I think the difficulty is that we, we all know what we're trying to deliver and the Dutch is doing its natural capital audits at the moment um, across all its farm state, looking at soil, air, water, biodiversity, et cetera. But the, still the question is, you know, how is it going to be paid for? If you don't actually have food or timber to sell, Who's going to pay for that, that water, that air? We're looking at biodiversity net gain. You're looking at carbon payments, et cetera. But a lot of this, even NELMS, is still so sort of unknown at the moment and uncertain. So we're asking people to make significant land use changes um, when really we're not quite clear at the moment where the funding streams are coming from. But I have no, no doubt personally that trees and woodlands, you know, are, are an essential part of the farming operation. And you could look at... Um, you know, water, soil, stock welfare, as well as income streams like 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 from orchards, the sort of thing Stephen Briggs is doing, and there is there is there is an income to be made from it. Uh, thanks, Grant. Um, I'm getting a few questions here about the sort of confusion between different grants that are available out there and how we can probably bring them together as one. Um, I think that really is a call from across the land management industry that we need to be. Um, getting this information that we need at this critical time. Um, but I'm also getting questions here, uh, looking at how, how we can use potentially change of use for land and the restrictions that are on it at the moment. Um, as, as a woodland, um, as a forester and a woodland manager, uh, once something is woodland, it's very hard to permanently deforest it. And as a farmer, there seems to be a, a you know, a penalisation in creating trees and that you can't potentially turn that back into uh, farmland again. So I'm going to go to Stephen first and ask what he thinks about land use and the restrictions around that and maybe a, a way we can be more flexible and ask then Tyrion if he has any thoughts on it as well um, because uh, I think some innovative ideas are what we're looking for at this point. Well thanks for coming to me first and um, if you're looking for innovation you've come to the wrong place. Uh, no I think um, it, it's a really valid point and it does certainly put some people off um, even contemplating have any forestry on their land is this it's forever um, and I guess you know the way the rules are that is that is in effect what it is there's very little scope for um, certainly taking commercial woodland out of permanent commercial woodland um, so you know I think we need to we need to let the science lead the politics and not the other way around would be the only way to do it I understand. And uh, Tyrion, uh, any any thoughts on uh, sort of the permanency of land use and how uh, it, woodlands can maybe restrict that? 
Yeah, well, I, I'm also not necessarily the, the expert to ask on, on policy because I've also, in my projects, been trying to struggle through the uncertainty of, of policy um, and working out, well, how many trees can I plant on this piece of farmland? Um, and it's a point that needs to be clarified. I mean, the, the thing is with agroforestry is conceptually you're able to have permanent farming and permanent trees in the same area. Um, one suggestion that I've heard made is that maybe within a sa the same parcel, you can sort of divide, um, let's say, an alley as agricultural land from the row of trees as forested land. Um, and so within the same parcel, you're still getting the, the uh, interactions between the tr crop and the tree, but it's um, calculated on a sort of per meter, per square meter basis rather than on a parcel basis. So I think that's one of the key challenges right now is that we're working with parcels. And once you have a certain number of trees on that parcel, it's a forest or it's, it's a woodland, right? And that's, I think that's a key challenge and maybe finding a way to look at things on a per hectare basis or just looking at the use value. I know that's a bit of a, cha a challenge to look at every single specific case. So that's, I, I'm not entirely sure how to, how to solve that problem. Um, but that's oh, thanks. Yeah. No, I understand. Um, how about uh, Luke, from the Forest Commission's point of view, um, obviously we want afforestation, not deforestation, but how do we give that flexibility uh, that we're craving for to be able to manage the land in, in maybe potentially a new way? Yeah, well, I can't sort of speak from a official standpoint, I suppose, but in terms of I don't know the exact plan of what's going to happen. But I know that one idea that has been talked about, and I don't know whether this will make it through or not, is is this idea of, you know, with the whole holding approach that you focus on trying to attain a, a set percentage of woodland cover at any one time. So the areas where that woodland is might change over time, um, but you would also I guess want to look at having some areas which are always woodland, much like sort of long-term retention in a, uh, you know, in a UKFS compliant forest. You'd want to have areas that that remained as woodland for the for the additional benefits they bring, um, in terms of developing soils and you know mycorrhizae and things over time. So, but I think that could be a really interesting approach, particularly if you're looking at shelter belts and scrub and that kind of thing. And and it would kind of, I think it would make people less. Um, people get quite nervous when sort of scrub and things starts to develop because they start to think I might lose my basic payment if um, you know if I allow this scrub to develop I'm better go and clear it at which point you you know you're losing potential valuable habitat and cover and you're losing something that might end up turning into a woodland if it if it was allowed to to do its thing so you know I think we want to I think generally and again I'm not speaking from you know a place of complete authority here but I think generally we ought to be moving away from this um, very prescriptive um, very kind of top-down way of, of doing things and and giving land managers a bit more flexibility within certain parameters so we still want to be you know achieving those those same results and, and there's always people who are going to try and game the system but there is also a lot of people out there who want to do the right things and, and we need to give them the flexibility and, and the sort of responsibility to do that in a, in a, in a productive way. Thanks Luke. Um, I've just had a cracking question come in here uh, from the audience. Um, it's uh, what is the one development change that the panel would like to see in Elms to encourage and incentivize the planting of the right trees in the right place um, and more agroforestry? Um, I'm going to answer this one first to give the panel time to put their thoughts together. Then I'm going to go to uh, Garant, Tyrion, uh, Luke and Stephen. I won't pick any first this time, Stephen. <laughs> so I mean, personally, um, for me, the one thing I'd like to see in Elms uh, would be access to some sort of uh, funding for a baseline study into um, really what types and models are available for agroforestry and what would work on a specific land holding. Uh, that sort of uh, foundation study, I think, would be uh, really in important for landowners. Um, Joanne? Um, well, I, I think I'd like, going back to the point I said earlier, and I don't know if this answers the question truly, I'd like sufficient funding. I'd like sufficient funding that really recognises the cost of planting and maintaining going forward um, a tree. And I, I think so many people think you put the tree in the ground and that's the end of it. But I mean, if we're looking at, at woodlands that are going to thrive, survive, resilient, 
um, with all the pests and diseases coming our way, that, that, that requires an ongoing cost, and I'd like funding that recognises that. Uh, thanks, Gran. Uh, Tyrion? Um, they're both very good points. I think I relate to you a lot, um, uh, Nina, when you're talking about um, having a set of examples that you can go to um, where you can see how the practices actually work. And I think I would take it a step further and have real on the ground examples where people can visit um, uh, and see how it's working. Stephen mentioned earlier the value of people being able to go and see something in action and ask specific detailed questions and get into the get into the nitty gritty. And I think that's one real uh, potential added value is having a set of functional examples um, that we can look to uh, to exemplify the different sorts of agroforestry practices that you could get in different contexts. And from there you get from that you get a choice, um, a, a palette of choices in a sense and a way to approach the decision making. Thanks. Um, and uh, Luke? Um, I missed part of your question there, Nina, but I think it was about um, how we how we show kind of good examples and um, yeah, what resources. So the, so the question is, um, what one thing would we like to see in Elms um, yeah. to encourage uh, planting the right tree in the right place and more integration? Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if it is, I don't know whether it is necessarily um, the job of, of elms to kind of do that i suppose i, I think um I, i've as i was kind of saying before i think it, it's more i think that's more about the culture aspect of things i mean elms hopefully elms will deli will help to to pay for um the means to an end um if that makes any sense but i think to, in order to get there you need to start from the place of having the right motivation so um I think I think how we make sure how, how we get the right tree in the right place is is more about educating people coming together kind of as we are and and talking about um you know all the various issues at stake and being honest about it I mean the um there's a really interesting article today I just saw on the Guardian before coming on this talk about a, a farmer in um, the Howgills in Cumbria who's selling up and uh you know leaving his sheep farm and you know, talking about scrub creation and, and all that kind of good stuff, but nowhere in the whole article is there any mention of um, sort of timber or wood production. And in a, in an article about you know moving to a more sustainable future, and this as a country that imports eighty percent of the timber that we use, and I just I just feel like there's still so many blind spots, um, you know, in in all in all areas, and, and we need to and we really need to face up to that, all of us, and um, and I think the public need to be to be shown and um, you know we're working on or I'm working at the moment on a, on a series of case studies uh, for farmers um, looking at sort of different scales of, of woodland creation schemes that we've had throughout um, Yorkshire the northeast so I think providing examples for people showing them what can be done um, and how you go about doing it and what the kind of end result is I think sharing that information is is really key and, and how we go about it I think trying to find more innovative ways of sharing that information rather than just being you know uh, another case study on a piece of paper i think we need to make it more interactive we need to make it more real for people we need to get people out into the into the countryside and into the environments that they're not that familiar with and they only read about on a newspaper website um all of which is made more complex by covid and, and those kind of challenges and and the kind of polarization that we see um, that's kind of spurred on by the kind of online debate. So, um, yeah, how do we how do we move away from that polarization? How do we encompass everyone's um, everyone's views? How do we come to a place of a sensible middle ground? I don't know whether Elms can achieve that. I think I think that's down to us, really. And um, yeah, I think we all need to be moving from from this meeting forward and and finding ways that we can kind of cross those bridges together, I suppose. I understand that no, very much. Um, Stephen, what, what do you think? If you could put one thing in the new ELM scheme, um, or what would it be in regards well, to agroforestry? I'm, I'm going to make my apologies again for not really oh, sorry. Not being aware not of ELMs, ELMs but, but certainly in terms of, of any of the environment schemes that, that we've seen. Um, 
it's very hard to, to stick with one, so I'm afraid I'm going to be longer than that. Flexibility, I think, is, is, um, is key. Um, you know, many farmers see environment schemes as a soft way in, if you like, to hedging and to um, small scale farm forest creation. So, you know, it's not, it's not done at a huge scale on the farm, it's a small scale. And perhaps we should be using it as a stepping stone to developing larger scale on farm um, planting. I think, again, collaboration is the other thing, you know, we should be looking at landscape benefit. I mean, as farmers, we look at things, you know, we're, we're always talking about CPH, county parish holding. Perhaps it's the other way around. It's perhaps it's holding parish county we should be thinking about and, and how we integrate with our neighbours and how our county integrates with the neighbouring counties to develop a forestry strategy um, and a planting strategy. Um, and then in the management payments, flexibility in the management payments, as I said, in, in terms of allowing true agri-environment use of you know, areas underneath trees, areas around trees, um, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, uh, a real lot of sense. Um, and another good question that's come through here. Um, we're a bunch of farmers and foresters on this on this panel today. Uh, and um, we, as sort of the, the managers of a vast area of land, uh, landscape across the country, um, but we're not the only people involved in this. Um, is there, should we be drawing on other expertise as well as farming and forestry to make this collaboration work better? Um, just thinking off the top of my head, uh, some of the conservation and wildlife groups, or maybe even um, other industries and sectors, horticulture. Um, what expertise are we, should we be looking for that's outside of potentially our, our wheelhouses at the moment? Um, I'm gonna to go to Tyrion first on this one, uh, as I haven't picked you first for a while. Nice that you're trying to catch us out. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you make a good point about biodiversity, perhaps. I think is uh, there's a lot of value to be had from that because it's complex and it's, um, I think, a lot of uh, reasonably local biodiversity um, support groups or, um, shall we say, sort of county level uh, groups know a reasonable amount about what they would, li would like to achieve on a landscape level. So that definitely helps with understanding what a farmer can do to integrate their work into a landscape level um, impact. So that's that's pretty important. Um, well, in terms of other industries, there, there is, of course, um, a very strong case to be made for agroforestry as a way to clean um, or to keep clean water bodies, for example. So um, engaging with the water industry could be very interesting, both in terms of what needs to be done or to what extent things need to be done. And also the funding, you know, there could be some uh, some funding opportunities there as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, Grant, your thoughts? Uh, no, well, certainly um, there's a lot of other people we need to we, we need to consider. Um, yeah, ecologists, hydrologists, you know, um, climatologists. I mean, there's all sorts of people we need to um, we need to consider it, it, in this. And it's something, as I said, the Dutchies doing in, in this natural capital process. In fact, we've we've taken on uh, someone who was with Natural England. And they now work for us as one of our um, as one of our lead advisors. So someone with a very strong conservation background. I, I guess the only thing I'd say ultimately is is that um, there are many and varied interests in land management, and and I even have some difficulty being controversial with the right tree, right place um, load, um, slogan because actually even in the forestry community there would be a lot of disagreement about um, what's the right tree in the right place, and and making decisions via large committees is very difficult. So so we do have to gather all this information, this expertise, absolutely, but. But someone does have to make a decision at the end of the day and and if we really believe we want for instance 30,000 hectares of trees being planted every year until 2050 they're going to have to go somewhere and someone's going to have to sign off that piece of paper saying it can happen and 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 and, and that will involve change that will mean landscapes that people have looked at all their life that maybe fields or, or uplands are not going to look like that going forward and and other changes you know, yes, we need to use all the expertise and it's much, but ultimately a decision has to be made. And, and, and I said on a call recently, we, you know, we, 
we kind of know what the aspiration is now, but we've got to start turning it into action. And at the moment, say for a tree planting in England, we're, we're nowhere near it. So um, yes, use the information that's out there, but ultimately a decision has to be made and action has to happen. Um, otherwise we could, we could talk forever about this. I understand. It's almost it's it's almost bewildering when you start thinking of all the questions and all the sources that you could possibly go to. Um, so I'm going to start drawing this to a conclusion now, but I'm going to give the panel to um, a, an opportunity to uh, give me their final thoughts and and really around um, the question of uh, what 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 one thing do we need or what in a, a short as possible answer what do we need to make agroforestry more mainstream and uh, greater uptake. Um, I'm going to go to Luke, then Stephen, then Garant, and then Tyrion. There you go. Randomly picked. Um, I think I think we need to recognise that there's going to be different answers to that in, in different parts of the country. And we're, we are very diverse. You know, we have a very diverse landscape and that's part of what makes <clears throat> our country so special um our countries maybe I should say um but i think i think one of the, the key things for me that seems to keep jumping out is the kind of idea of, of flexibility and giving people credit for their kind of responsi responsibility for what they're doing um and i think i think we need to i think we need to still we need to have the capability to um, enforce some sort of penalties or um, you know have some sort of negative consequences for people who aren't looking after the land in maybe a way that's sustainable or that that benefits um, you know the rest of the rest of the population but also we need to recognize there's a lot of people who want to do the right things and you know if where if the resource is there if the will is there then we should allow we should allow these things to happen and they will you know they will happen naturally if they're allowed to um and we just you know the i think our role as sort of as a as a government or as the um you know forestry body or whoever it is natural england um you know the environment agency we need to we need to be supportive and be there with the good practice examples and the research to back it up um and to help people to make those good choices and and also to to look forward to to what's coming because we need to remember in all of this you know in our, with our changing climate, what we're doing now might not be the right thing to do in, in 5, 10, 25 years. We, we ought to be looking ahead uh, to what's coming and, and preparing ourselves and, and, and laying the ground now and uh, looking overseas. You know, you only have to look to Germany, France, Spain to see what, you know, what, what might be ahead. So we need to start building that resilience into the systems that we've got as well and, and making sure we're not caught on the back foot. Thanks, Luke. Um, I can't remember which order I said now, so I'm going to pick again randomly and say Tyrion. <laughs> oh, you got it in for me this time. Um, <laughs> um, if I could choose one thing, there have been lots of good points that come up, to be honest, but collaboration is a really big thing here, I think. And I'm really glad that this conversation is uh, is happening and I think more conversations like this could happen and more uh, even more um, let's say technically driven conversations because there are a lot of deep technical questions that need to be addressed not just um, concepts or uh, for example policy but really how do you do something like if you're an organic farmer how do you manage the the weeds in a tree line for example you know serious technical questions like this and I think meaningful engagement between currently relatively siloed sectors um, based around real examples, things that people have done with proof that it has some merit um, would be a really valuable thing, I think. And I'm, I'm looking forward to these conversations continuing um, because that's, I think, where productive change can happen when people really listen to each other and understand each other's perspective. Brilliant. Um, thank you. And well said. Um, We'll go to Stephen next. Uh, well, I guess, do, do we need to listen to the science more? And if we are listening to the science, which science do we believe? Um, I don't know, I, I got on my Google feed this morning a report um, from the Irish Times um, questioning whether forestry is actually locking up carbon or not. And it depends very much on the type of forestry and um, 
sort of large scale denudation of forestry from um, you know um, clear clear felling large tracts. You know you're getting soil disturbance and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I mean that's another that's a science going against everything that we are believing up till now. So we need to find out which which of the sciences we believe and which one we listen to. Um, the question I have, and I've been sort of mulling it over since I was asked to come on the panel, is should it be mandatory to have some form of forestry area on every farm? Um, but at the same time, you no, know, say mandatory to have 5% approximately, or just a, a figure, that's a figure I've just taken. But at the same time, should there be a maximum that every unit is allowed to plant? And that would go some way to removing the distrust that all of a farm, neighboring farm that came on the market was going to be bought up by somebody to be completely planted. You know, so is there some kind of structured landscape? And again, I come back to the holding county parish approach rather than the county parish holding approach. Um, you know, we need, we need to be thinking bigger, integrated, um, flexible, you know, within what we can plant, where we can plant. Um, but yeah, I think we need to we need to talk a lot more about this um, between farming, forestry, environmentalists, landscape planners. The whole community needs to get together to decide where we want to go. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, Garant, any any closing closing thoughts on this? Well, yeah, and then just and four very brief, very briefly. I mean, government can offer carrots and wheeled stick, and they need to think about how they how they do that. I mean, collaboration is vital, and I think it's great that land management and the Institute of Chartered Foresters are, and I see many other organisations represented by some of the participants um, joining in. But you know, we need to be having these conversations with um with 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 farming and forestry organisations and environmental and getting together about this. I mean, education is critical. Uh, agricultural colleges and forestry faculties need to be embedding this in the curriculum. And um, and I can't speak for all of them, but some I think might still be playing catch up a bit here, and we need to. We need to make sure that the, the, the young generation of professionals are coming out with this knowledge. And I would also just add it on uh, exemplars, because I think we need we need demonstration sites. We, we use the term often in the Dutch EC and is believing. And I think, you know, if you go to someone like Stephen Briggs near Peterborough or somewhere like that, then you, you come away at least in part convinced. And, and let's be honest, the best people to talk to farmers are farmers. And, and if another farmer is doing it and believes in it, then they're going to be the best person to convince their their peers. And so I do think we need a network of exemplars around the UK that, that are easily accessible as, a, as, a, as an education and training facility. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I want to bring this, draw this to a close now, because I think we've run out of time. Um, I want to thank um, our panel for their time today and their really interesting views. I think we could have gone on for hours and have just really brushed the, the start of this topic. Um, and also for Land Management 2.0 and the ICF for hosting this uh, webinar today. Um, bringing it into a close, I mean, there's a clear desire I can see here for greater collaboration and uh, an opportunity now with Brexit and UK planting objectives to do more. Um, but looking at the questions that have come in today and the thoughts from the panel, um, there seems to be some real limiting factors, knowledge and information and advance notice of future grant scheme seems to be a big call. Um, access to experts and proper levels of funding is also really highlighted here today. Um, so what do we need moving forward? Uh, again, it's, it's, it, it, it is everything above and a little bit more, um, but it's great to see that the discussions here have started talking about flexibility um, in land management and acceptance of change. Uh, so I think it's really hopeful moving forward. Um, and finally, I want to flag that in the chat and uh, sections here, there has been some really interesting resources that have been highlighted, including the Soil Association Agroforestry Study. Um, the Game and Wildlife Trust have a pilot project, which is also very interesting. And um, um, Wales have a, um, a study on the subject as well, uh, Welsh Natural Resources. Um, I would like to highlight to all that, those to all those that are listening. And um, there's also a call, Tyrion, for some more information on the pilot product, project you're doing. Um, over in Wiltshire as well. Um, thank you everyone for your time today. It's been really interesting um, and um, wish everyone luck in the future. Thank you. <laughs>